Hey there everyone, welcome to lesson two of theme two GCSE Geography. So we're moving on to looking at when it comes to deciding where to build new stuff. Do we build it on brownfield sites or do we build it on greenfield sites? So we're going to construct definitions for both of these new key terms. We're then going to evaluate each of these types of sites, brownfield versus greenfield. What are the upsides and downsides? That's what evaluate means. Remember, you look at the advantages and the disadvantages. And we're then going to interpret how if you redeveloped a brownfield site in an urban area, so in a town or city, how might that development affect different groups of people that were already living in that area. So go ahead and pause the video here in a moment and write down the title Brownfield versus Greenfield. Okay, so the first thing to look at really is, well, why are we even having this discussion? Why do we need to build more stuff? Well, as we sort of know, there are various challenges facing um, humanity at the moment, I guess, one of which is population growth. So if we actually look at physically what this translates into with regards to housing, the UK population is increasing, not as rapidly as population is increasing in low income countries, but it's estimated that across Britain in the next few years, we're going to need several hundred thousand extra homes. And you can see here from this infographic, we don't have Scotland or Ireland. So this is just for England and Wales. Well, not for Wales even. This is just for England. The size of the house represents how much new housing is needed in that area. And you can see, even in the southeast alone, 855,000 new homes. Southwest, 438 new homes. Um, if you add all this up, it's a couple of million new homes. Now, this data, in an exam, if they gave you data like this, sometimes they might say, what are the limitations of this data? A limitation means what's wrong with it that means it might not be true or might not be reliable. So in the case of this data, what could mean that this data has a limitation or mean that it might be unreliable? Yeah, it's the date, okay? Obviously, we're in 2020 right now. This data is from 2016, so it's already out of date. So that's a limitation that means that what we're looking at may not be reliable. And it's one of the key things to look for is the date that the data was um, captured on or taken from is often an easy limitation to look for if you get a question like that in an exam. But we're going to use this infographic for the purpose of what we're talking about. So we're talking about several million new homes needed across Britain in the next few years. The question is, where are we going to build those homes? Okay, we need more space, we need more land to build on. Do we build it on brownfield or do we build it on greenfield? So why is the demand for housing increasing? The birth rate in Britain is actually relatively low. Okay, we don't have really high birth rates like we do in LICs. So our population is growing, but population growth isn't the main cause of an increased demand for housing because it's actually relatively low. Our birth rate is quite low. Most of our population growth is actually as a result of immigration. So increasing population isn't the main driving force behind the demand for housing. <laughs> Technical hitch there. We'll just wait for the buzzer to finish. So what I'd like you to do is either make a subheading, why is demand for housing increasing, or a bubble like I've done here. You won't need more than half a page. We're going to write four things around this. And to identify what is driving the increased demand for housing, I'd like you to go onto the Moodle page where you found this lesson, and there's a short video clip that talks about demand for housing, and I'd like you to watch that, please. So pause the video here a moment, put this as a subheading or a, or a bubble for a spies diagram, and go ahead, come out of the PowerPoint for a sec, and watch that video clip. Okay, so there should be at least four factors that you could identify from that video clip that are driving the demand for increased housing across Britain. And it's mostly due to a shift in our lifestyles. So first off, one in three marriages now ends in divorce. Divorce rates are higher than they've ever been. And that means that a family that was living in one house now needs two houses. So you've effectively doubled the number of houses needed per family. In addition to that, People are now living longer. We've got better healthcare, better diets, better quality of life. So our life expectancy has increased. So the home that you've had all your life, you're living in it for longer. You're not dying and freeing it up for somebody else to move in. Furthermore, we've got changing lifestyles and changing expectations. It used to be traditionally 
in your early 20s, you meet someone, you get married, you move in, you start a family. Now, the culture has shifted far more towards having a career first, maybe doing a bit of traveling, especially for women as well. People are choosing to stay single for longer and buy their own home first. So you need more individual homes because people are staying single for longer and buying their own houses. And finally, like I mentioned earlier, we've got increasing immigration. So that is driving population growth. It's not the main factor, but it is one of the factors. So these four things combine to mean that we're going to need several million new homes across Britain. Write these down and then we're going to think about where on earth are we going to put all these houses. Okay, so we're going to evaluate. We're going to look at the pros and cons of building homes on a brownfield site and the pros and cons of building homes on a greenfield site. And it's not just homes. Of course, when you're building homes, you're going to need roads, you're going to need houses, uh, you're going to need roads, you're going to need schools, leisure centres, shops, all the other things, all the other infrastructure that comes with houses. So it's not just new land for building houses homes, it's new land for building all the things that come with it. And the spread of urban areas, building all these new things, is called urbanisation. So, where should we allow our towns and cities to spread? Should we recycle areas within towns or cities that are run down and derelict um, and probably boarded up, not being used? Land which has already been developed, land which has already been built on like that, we call it a brownfield site. A greenfield site is exactly what it says on the tin, land which has never been built on. It is a green field. Usually you'll find this in the urban rural fringe of the Burgess model or out into the rural area. So, pause the video here a minute and go ahead and put down those two definitions, please. Okay, so in the handout accompanying this lesson, you've got these two photographs. So if you have a printer, you can go ahead and print these out. We're going to use them as the center to a spider diagram for each site. If you don't have a printer, don't stress about it. Instead of putting a photo in the center of your spider diagram, just write the words brownfield site and greenfield site. So we're going to deal with greenfield sites first. So either cut and stick or write greenfield site in a bubble. You'll need about half a page worth of space. All right, then, so let's just actually have a think about this. If you're a developer, you're looking to build a load of new homes or maybe some new office space, why would you prefer a greenfield site? The view is nicer, which means that you can probably charge more money for the homes that you build. There's more space, so you can build bigger homes to charge more money and make more money because the homes you're selling are going to be bigger. Plus, there's no cleanup costs. With a brownfield site, anything that's already there, quite often there'll be um, leftover chemicals or maybe leftover asbestos. We now understand asbestos is very, very dangerous. So there's cleanup costs associated with dealing with a brownfield site that you don't have uh, that you don't have with a greenfield site. So it will save you time and money in that respect. On the other hand, because it is a blank canvas, sewage pipelines, water pipelines, roads, electricity connections. Uh, internet connections, you're going to have to pay to put all of that in because it isn't already existing in the area. That's called infrastructure. Everything behind the scenes that you need to connect everything and make everything run. And that's going to cost you a lot of money to put in because it's not already there. Plus, trying to get permission to build on a site like this might be quite difficult. You're going to face a lot of opposition from people that already live there, people that live in the rural area, the farmers, the retired people, the high income families living in the urban rural fringe, people are not going to be very happy if you destroy the area to put new homes or businesses. So you're going to face wide ranging opposition. You might not actually even get permission if it is green belt. Green belt means you are not allowed to build on it. Plus, of course, you'd be ripping down habitats. So there's an environmental concern there. In addition, on the environmental note, once you put homes and businesses there, you're going to have people coming in and out by car all the time, and that's going to increase the air pollution and contribute to climate change and lower the quality of life of people in the area that have respiratory issues. So, very much upsides. Appealing environment, it's uncontaminated, blank canvas, so that's going to save you money. And the fact that it looks so nice will probably kick in something called the positive multiplier effect. So, you build new homes and businesses, that brings more people to the area and creates more jobs. If 
people have got more jobs, they've got more money to spend, they've got more disposable income, the spare cash that you have left over at the end of the month once you've paid your bills. And you're going to want to spend that disposable income on nice things in other shops. So more businesses move in and that creates more jobs and more money. So more businesses and more people move in and you have this kind of positive feedback loop kick in. It's called the positive multiplier effect, which is great for the economy and great for job opportunities in the area. Conversely, of course, more people and more development does bring problems with it, mostly for the environment and mostly for the people that are already living there. OK, so pause the video here a moment. I would suggest using different colours, a colour for positives and a colour for negatives. I've used black for positive and black for negative. So I would suggest doing the same in your books. Pause the video here a moment and go ahead and put those notes down around your image or around your bubble. OK, so we're now going to do the same for brownfield sites. So here's our brownfield image. Either cut and stick it or put a bubble that says brownfield sites. So obviously this doesn't look great. But from an environmental point of view, you're recycling land that's already been built on. So you're not tearing down new habitats. Um, so that's going to be great from a conservationist, from an environmental point of view. Furthermore, all the infrastructure you already need is there. The pipe works are already underground. You can see there's um, some sort of connection here, probably to electricity wires running across. Your infrastructure's there already. So that's going to save you some money because you don't have to put that in. When you improve the look of inner city urban areas like this, it will kick in the positive multiplier effect again. You'll get high income people moving in because it's close to the CBD where the high paid jobs are. So if you make nice apartments, nice offices, high income people move in. They've got a lot of disposable income. So more shops and businesses will move in and it just kick starts a regeneration in the area, boosting the economy and providing job opportunities. But your cleanup costs are probably going to be through the roof. You've got to remove asbestos. You've got to remove broken glass. You've got to remove spilled chemicals. Furthermore, there's often a stigma attached to sites like this. So even after you've made them nice, people still, when they think of that area, have a negative idea attached to it. So you might find that you have a problem selling the homes or apartments that you've built or getting businesses to rent the office space that you've created because of the stigma, because of like a negative idea in people's heads of what the area was always like. Oh. <laughs> Hello? Hi, are you right? Yeah, she messaged me this morning. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, exactly. Bless her. Yeah. Yeah, no, she did send me a quick message. I was going to let you know in case you didn't know as well, but uh, there we are. Yeah, we'll have to um, play it by ear. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, we can take care of it. No worries. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm not going to start the whole recording again because it's just, it's more faff than it's worth. So anyway, as I was saying, you'll have the stigma attached to, to this area, which may mean that you could have trouble selling the apartments or renting out the office space that you've created. So on the upside, you've got the positive multiplier kicking in, you're recycling, your infrastructure's already there. That's going to save you some money and you're cleaning up the area. This is great. But the downside being those cleanup costs could be quite high. You might struggle because of stigma. Um, developing a brownfield site might cost you more, like I said, because of cleanup and redevelopment will increase house prices in the area. So because brownfield sites are usually in inner city areas, the people that live there, as we discussed in last lesson, are quite often low income families. Well, if you come in and start making everything super nice and high income people start moving in, that's going to drive up the cost of living and drive up house prices. So people that are already living there could well be forced out. So go ahead and pause the video here for a moment and add these notes around your image or around your bubble for brownfield sites. OK, so the final thing we're going to do to just for me to see how well you've actually understood the evaluations of the sites um, is look at, well, how would redevelopment of a site like this impact upon three different groups of people? OK, so here's our three groups. Now, I am reinforcing stereotypes here. That's not obviously something that commonly we would do, but I want us to use our empathy skills and put ourselves in the shoes of these three people. So here's your scenario. 
There are plans to redevelop a brownfield site in an inner city area of Swansea by building some modern executive flats and offices. Write about what the following types of people might think about this idea. So, this is Vicky. She's a young single mum living on a council estate in the inner city. She is low income and no car. If the area that she lives in is redeveloped into high-end apartments and high-end office space, for her that's going to mean that house prices in the area go up and the cost of living in the area goes up. So if she ever wants to move out of the council housing and try and buy her own home, there's no way she's going to be able to afford it. In addition, the office space being created is normally for high-end professional jobs. She doesn't have the qualifications to access these jobs, so it's not going to benefit her. So this is bad news for her. Alan, on the other hand, at the moment, he runs his high-powered business in the CBD. Because the CBD is so densely populated and crowded with offices, the office rent is really, really high. Most people that run businesses out of an office don't own that office block. They pay rent to whoever owns it. And because space is so, uh, so much in short supply in the CBD, office rent is normally really, really high, and that eats into your profits. So, if there's going to be a brownfield site redevelopment in the inner city, right next to the CBD, but because there's a little bit more space and it's a new redevelopment, the office rent is probably going to be cheaper. This is great news for him, because cheaper office rent means more profit, because you're not paying as high a bills for your rent. Plus, the high-end apartments and executive flats being created will attract young professionals, which is the perfect job market from which he wants to, um, employee market from which he wants to bring people in to work for him. Finally, this is Peter. He's had a promotion. He now works for the Environment Agency in Swansea. He kind of feels that this is a bit of a double-edged sword, really. There's two sides to the coin here for him. So he thinks, on the one hand, this is good for the environment because they're redeveloping a brownfield site, which means no further habitats will be destroyed. However, executive flats means more people coming in for work, um, for living, and executive offices means more people coming in for work. They're going to be coming in and out mostly by car, which means more air pollution, more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, contributing to climate change. So what I'd like you to do, again, you've got these images in your handout if you're able to print them, but if not, don't worry. Just copy and complete the sentences, re-listen to what I've explained if necessary, and add any own thoughts that you might have. Okay, if you've got a little bit stuck on that, or in a bit of a pickle, or struggled a bit, then here's a little bit more guidance if necessary. If you've done it, go ahead and check yours against this and see if there's anything extra you can add. If you were really stumbling, then go ahead and get some of these ideas down in your book. And once you've done that, that's the end of lesson two. Oh, they're mowing the lawns right outside the window now as well. Brilliant. <laughs> that's the end of lesson two. So what we're going to move on to next lesson is looking at how towns and cities are continuing to spread and what that means for redevelopment of our urban and rural areas. Again, as usual, if you have any questions or queries, feel free to contact me, gleasona at hubcumry.net.